September 9th to INC Public Forum on Plateau Park Hill, um, water diversion and the INC and the I-70 um, expansion. Um, so thank you all for coming here to Manuel. And um, my name is Loretta Kaler and I'm the chair of today's meeting. Um, I'm going to do a very brief introduction, but I want everyone to know that if you hadn't picked up the handouts that are outside, they have the bios of everyone, which will, will really do um, a very more thorough job of explaining who everyone is. Um, and I won't do justice to that because we don't have the time to go into that. Um, so what we have today is a panel of, of experts and um, and they will be presenting for five, maybe six minutes, um, and then we will have just a very brief break. All of you, if you haven't picked up a white card, a three by five card, and you have a question, please pick one up, um, write a question. There will be people out in the audience picking up the cards after we have the panel, give their presentations, and then then the moderator will have those questions and be able to ask these individuals those questions. So again, let me go through and just identify. When I say your name, I don't think everybody's sitting in order, so I am just going to go through and um, introduce everyone very briefly. So if you can just raise your hand or maybe stand up, whatever you want to do is fine by me. So uh, let me start off with, I'm going to start off with Patty Ortiz. Um, she's a civil geotechnical engineer and has worked in water and um, in Superfund sites. Um, we have Dennis Royer, and he is a traffic engineer. He's a former manager of public works in both Denver and in Boston. Um, we have Albert Bert Melcher, and he is an expert on, um, he's a civil engineer and he's done a great deal of work on highways. Um, John Van Skyver, um, and he is also a civil and structural engineer with uh, many years of water experience. Um, Kyle Zeppelin, I want, did it die again? No. Um, Kyle Zeppelin, um, developer, and he's done many projects, taxi to name one. Um, Andrea Gelfuso, Gelfuso's. <laughs> She's an environmental attorney and um, she works on Clean Air Act and on the lawsuit that's currently pending. Um, Do I have everyone? Did I? William. Bill. Bill DeGroote, a civil engineer and expert on stormwater and floodplain management. Um, so that's your esteemed panel. Our moderator today, thank you, and our moderator today, this is a great um, panel of experts, so it's a good time to ask questions. And our moderator today is Lucia Brown. Um, and so she will be here today, and she will be here today helping to moderate all the process. So I'm going to hand over the microphone to her. Good morning, everybody. We're just going to get right into it in the interest of time. And Dennis, would you like to get going? Morning, everybody. As kind of an introduction for you, if you think I'm going to be able to tell you everything that went on in a 9,400-page-plus final environmental impact statement in five minutes, I can't do that. And the record of decision is 252 appendices. So if you want to have some fun reading this stuff, please feel free to go to the CDOT website and read this stuff. I'm going to give you some quick points, overview of what we've dealt with in the last 15 years, okay? The viaduct itself. CDOT from day one has told everybody this viaduct has got to come down. It's in horrible shape. When they started in 2003, this viaduct was only 39 years old. It's now 54 years old. If you talk to the CDOT staff bridge at their headquarters, they will tell you if you properly maintain a bridge, it should last 75 to 100 years. 
So you can understand why the viaduct has to come down. CDOT hasn't maintained it. Oh, they'll tell you they have. But what you also have to find out if you check backwards is that CDOT currently ranks 50th out of 50 states in terms of maintenance of infrastructure in the United States. They would be 51st if we could include the District of Columbia. So I just want you to know that from day one, and that's been their position. That's why they keep arguing they've got to do this quarter, okay? Their current plan, if you don't know it, is approximately 300 feet wide in the depressed section, okay? It actually gets wider in some of the other sections when they bring the ramps in, okay? The current viaduct is only 88 feet wide, and then ramps, wherever they come in, add a little additional, okay? They're putting frontage roads on both sides. Uh, Ron Straka, a local architect, something like eight years ago said, what do you need a north frontage road for? That's just another 45 feet taken out of the neighborhood, which is absolutely right. And when they get to the cover that they're building over the depressed section, there's no north frontage road. So you have to ask, why the intrusion into the neighborhood for this additional distance? And like we say, the north frontage road is not necessary. The south frontage road is the replacement for 46th Avenue. 46th Avenue currently goes under the current viaduct. The neighbors wanted the roadway on the south side because that's where most of the industrial area and that would keep the trucks farthest from the residential portion, the one roadway, okay? The plan that they have, 297 feet wide, can be restriped to 14 lanes. CDOT originally said they were doing 10 lanes, then they said now they're telling everybody, oh, we're only going to do eight. They're gonna build the entire cross section. You do not dig a hole in the ground and only build part of it. You build the entire width, you pave it in, you're gonna move the traffic off of the viaduct into the trench, then they tear the viaduct down, finish the trench to the south. But they have 16 foot inside medians, which you do not need. That would, that's what allows them to restrike this in the future if they want to to 14 lanes, which means they could have eight managed lanes and we will still only have six general traffic lanes for those of us who don't want to pay the toll. Now, whoa. Sorry about that. CDOT claims they've looked at all these various alternatives. If you've followed any of what's been going on with the local neighborhood groups up there, there's one alternative in particular they wanted, which was, we've called the reroute alternative, which was run it up 270 to 76 and around. It adds a mile and a half, two miles to the total distance, but it would take the viaduct and the roadway completely out of the neighborhood and not cause the problems. And through Adams County, there's only like 75 homes within half a mile of those roadways. So from a residential impact standpoint or whatever, there's far less impact. CDOT's entire analysis of that alternative consisted of a one and a half page cost estimate, which they claimed would cost $4.2 billion to build that segment. So it was too expensive and they tossed it out. Under the environmental rules in NEPA, it says all viable alternatives have to be rigorously and thoroughly reviewed. We kind of object to a one and a half page cost estimate as being rigorously and thoroughly reviewed. And that's why you've heard many people arguing about that point, okay? Adams County has wanted 270 taken care of. And if you know anything about that area, 270 is the most congested corridor on the interstate system in the metro area. It is jammed every day by three o'clock in the afternoon. We went to a meeting in Adams County where they met with the people up there and they had been promising 270 for 20 years. They informed everybody at this meeting, oh, you're in the next 20 year plan. So Adams County is sitting there going, when do we get something? Of course, this is intentional by the part of CDOT because if they did something on 270, that would take away from I-70. So I-70 is where they're putting everything, okay? Now, I wanna point out a few violations of NEPA along the way. One of them is called segmentation. When you define a corridor, you have to review the entire corridor. They define the corridor as west of the mousetrap, or I-25, to Tower Road. But if you read the FEIS, Record of Decision, it's all basically Brighton Boulevard to Tower Road. They left the mousetrap out. 
One of the questions I posed to them early on was, why are you tying your managed lanes on I-25 to the managed lanes on I-70 so people coming out of downtown get in the managed lanes and they get right on I-70? Their explanation was, well, we'd have to rebuild the entire mousetrap. I looked at it and said to them, gee, I could do it with a couple ramps. Why can't you? And they go, oh, no. That would add hundreds of millions of dollars to the cost that we can't afford it. Another thing we have to deal with is hazmat. There are going to be other people here. Mine is, they haven't really told you much about it in their study. And when Executive Director Bat was out at the Swansea uh, meeting, all his answers to this was, don't worry, we're going to use the best state-of-the-art protection we can while we build this for you. But other than that, they will give you no details as to how they're going to handle any of this. And they're going through the most polluted zip code, if you've read the articles, in the entire United States. But don't worry, okay? The other problem we've had, and I testified at the City Park Golf Course, is they set up an agreement in 2015 with the city to do detention at the City Park Golf Course to block the water from getting to I-70, the press section, and the National Western, which is the primary historic flow. So they want to rip out a historic golf course to intercept that. Well, the problem with this is by signing that agreement in 2015 in the middle of their environmental process, they were obligated to put that in the report. They didn't do it. So technically, by not having this as what's called a connected action, they violated the NEPA law again by not even explaining it to everybody. But the IGA signed with the city specifically says this is for I-70 drainage protection, okay? <laughs> How many more points do you have there, Dennis? Pardon? How many more points do you have because we're at six minutes? I just got a couple quick ones. A couple quick ones, all okay. right. <clears throat> One of the things you also have to understand very quickly is that CDOT does what I call wordsmithing, and you can follow along in your packets on this or whatever about various things that they do, about how this is the best solution, but if you go into the final appendix of traffic, you find out that the best solution is actually 10 general traffic lanes, similar to what we did on T-Rex. Uh, they also claim they're improving connectivity in the neighborhood. Well, how do you depress the roadway? You put a deck over it that's only for pedestrians and bicyclists and cut off all these streets and you have better connectivity into the neighborhood. I'll let it go at that. We want you to ask questions. We'll deal with other issues at that time. And next we have Bill DeGroote. And you don't have to get up, but if you want to, you can if you feel more comfortable. No, I'm staying right here. Okay. <laughs> Behind the table. And, uh, got a PowerPoint? Is this counting against my time? <laughs> And apparently we can't do anything with the lights, so um, I, I think it'll be okay. Okay, there we go. It says, uh, oh crap, was that today? And I think they found one of those dinosaurs up in Thornton the other day. Yeah. Okay, I've got uh, four issues I'd like to talk about. Um, the first is the, uh, the Platte to Park Hill project that Dennis alluded to, the uh, P2PH, is directly linked to the proposed I-70 ditch. You just can't get away from it, which means they violated the, uh, the EIS. And much of the uh, project uh, decision-making has been done in secret. Um, the third point is there was an abrupt change in uh, drainage design frequency in the Montclair Basin. I'll discuss that a little bit. And then funding the, uh, the project is, uh, in my view, an abuse of Denver's drainage fee. 
As Dennis said, the intergovernmental agreement between CDOT and Denver clearly links uh, the ditch to the Park Hill, Platt to Park Hill project. I just can't say that. I'm going to just call it a project. Okay? Um, for example, the CDOT gets to review and comment on the construction drawings at the 30% and 60% completion points. And then uh, Denver has to tell CDOT how they address all of those points. Now, if it's independent, what is that all about? Also, CDOT requires a $5,000 a day penalty for every day the project uh, is not done on time. And again, if, if they're separate, well, what's that all about? And finally, joint hydrology studies by Denver, CDOT, the Urban Drainage and Flood Control District and RTD also show clearly that the projects are linked. So when I see them say they're not, I just said, how do you do that? You know, how do you do that as a, a professional? Okay, design flood frequency and secrecy. The past drainage construction in the Montclair Basin was based on a five-year uh, design, five-year uh, rainfall design. Farrell Lake, if you're familiar with that one, they, in City Park, those improvements were done to a five-year. That was done by Denver and Urban Drainage. Uh, RDD A line was held to a five-year standard when uh, they put uh, that line in. Uh, there was a, a pipe outlet that was being designed and ready for construction from the uh, South High River up to 39th that was suddenly uh, pulled and uh, the whole area between the plant and um, the golf course was pulled from the, the uh, study that was going on, let me back up, I missed this. The Joint Denver Urban Drainage Drain, uh, Master Plan was ongoing, and in the middle of it, they pulled that segment out, Denver did. Said it's done, we're not gonna study it anymore, you're not gonna see it, and just assume that what we give you is done when you complete the Master Plan. little sidebar here. The 100-year uh, design standard is a minimum. And when you're digging a 40-foot ditch, 40-foot deep ditch, crossing the drainage, putting people in cars in it, it should be a, a higher standard than the, uh, the just the 100-year. Larger floods can and do occur, as we've been seeing. Uh, these uh, papers are from the uh, 2013 floods in Colorado. I have a little problem in Houston. <laughs> Florida. <laughs> and you probably can't read that, but the uh, one person in the boat is saying, when was the, our last 100-year flood? And the answer is last Tuesday. <laughs> so a 100-year flood standard is just not uh, acceptable, I don't believe. And let me finish with the abuse of the uh, Denver storm drainage fee. First, it's a, remember, it's a fee and not a tax. If it was a tax, you'd get to vote on it. Since it's a fee, they can raise it whenever they want, as high as they want, as long as it's supposedly used for drainage. <coughs> now, they started abusing it a long time ago in the, in the Webb administration when they uh, decided to pay for half of uh, all curb and gutter on new streets was the, the, the uh, drainage fee. Now, curb and gutter's always been considered to be part of the road and it would be a transportation cost. But they found they could just take a few dollars here and there and expand their uh, road building at the expense of the, uh, the drainage fee. 
But then it really got bad in uh, 2016 when the uh, city council raised the uh, uh, fee dramatically as the uh, Denver Post headline shows. And then over half the new fee is being used on this one project. Okay, we're at six minutes. Ooh, okay. Well, here we go. The, the drainage fee is now being used for a brand new golf course, a brand new co golf course clubhouse, 30,000 green fees for lost business at the golf course, and part of it for an interstate highway. Denver citizens are being hurt in two ways. First, you pay a, a larger fee, and then the money is used for other purposes. So that uh, apparently anything is rain, that is rained upon is now eligible for the uh, drainage fee. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you, Bill. Thank you. <laughs> and next, <laughs> next we have Bert Melcher. Thanks. Um, I've been involved with the EIS on this project since 2003 when the first Citizens Advisory Committee was set up. Uh, and I, incidentally, I have been a CDOT commissioner, which gives me some interesting insights into their mentality. Uh, just to start, uh, basically the CDOT mission is, to, is mobility for vehicles. Other factors, human and environment, human beings and environment, those are essentially secondary and uh, of very less importance. To illustrate this, I attended a, a statewide meeting where the, uh, of the CDOT, uh, where the planning division presented its new environmental program uh, presented by their head of their environmental division. It dealt entirely with the issue of producing the best possible documentation. Uh, absolutely nothing about attention to the human environment, protection of health, etc. But I guess the message is as long as you cover your butt with environment, with uh, bureaucratic paperwork, that's all you need to do. Uh, but the laws require a hard work look, as Dennis pointed out at the environment, not just bureaucratic uh, documentation. Uh, the essence of it is this makes CDOT into a political and not a professional engineering uh, organization. Uh, Bert, could you put the mic a little farther from your mouth? Please? Pardon? Could you put the mic farther from your mouth? A little further? Okay. I can whisper too. <laughs> uh, Let's see, the, the uh, major problems associated with there are two fatal flaws. First, uh, the process has a predetermined outcome. Uh, the final project alternatives that truly avoid major harm and that provide meaningful protection to people and their community were looked at, but only in a cursory manner. Other presenters are dealing with this subject, as we already know and with the uh, problem of alternatives, which I support the statements that those were very poorly analyzed. Some impact mitigation alternatives were adopted, such as windows, air conditioning, and school uh, modification. But these are basically kind of band-aids in the larger scheme of things. Second, there's a considerable misrepresentation, and it's indefensible, and deception on the true dollar cost of the full EIS East project. Uh, the EIS Central cost, which is what we're dealing with basically immediately, is given at about 1.12 billion. But the total EIS project cost is about 1.42 billion. Add to this the uh, connected uh, drainage problem product and the east end of I-70 from uh, Chambers to Tower Road, and also the mousetrap. These costs uh, drainage about 300 million, mousetrap probably 100 million to 300 million subsidies have spent half a billion bucks on uh, interchanges like this. Uh, you add all those together and uh, 
that uh, the true cost of the total EIS project is at least 1.87 billion to 2.07 billion, depending on the cost of uh, rehab of the mousetrap. Uh, EPA also estimates risks, and they figure that uh, risks such as inflation, cost overruns, and so forth could add about 450 million more. Uh, this could get the whole project up to a total of almost two and a half billion dollars. These cost concerns also severely affect the proper comparison of alternatives. Cost is used as a criterion in uh, comparing them, compounded by the public-private partnership. There's been almost no transparency and disclosure on that, but this is something that needs to be followed in great detail. Uh, Turning to environmental, wait a second here. Yeah, environmental uh, justice, environmental justice and civil rights, subject I feel very strongly about. But the both the National Environmental Policy Act and of course the Civil Rights Act of 1964 form the basis for addressing and dealing with these uh, considerations. Uh, there are a lot of documents on the whole subject of uh, especially the civil rights. But my favorite is a concise and precise uh, 1997 uh, document by Secretary of Transportation Federico Pena. And this was uh, restated in 2012. Uh, the executive order isn't a law, but it's policy and guidance which means basically that CDOT can thumb its nose at this if it wants to, has no legal standing. But uh, uh, the document covers how to document impacts on low-income and minorities. Uh, gives a definition of adverse impacts which are to be avoided or mitigated, such as health, sickness, death, community cohesion, etc. about 23 or four different items there. Uh, now it also talks about criteria for assessing alternatives and their impacts. To eliminate an alternative based on cost, the difference in cost must be, quote, extraordinary magnitude, unquote. Uh, the fourth interrelated uh, project constitute a single project. Uh, as as it has been mentioned. Thank you, Bert. We're over at six minutes, so can. Uh... Okay, I've got more information. I want to talk a little bit about community cohesion and character. Uh, this is a major problem, and uh, I won't go into it, but how to maintain com community cohesion, a community that hangs together, people know each other, uh, have commonalities, et cetera, stability. Uh, that's a major problem. And, as uh, INC, it won't take time to go into as that. INC members here, I think we all understand the importance of community cohesion. That's why we're all here, isn't that right? Exactly. I hope so. Thank you. And uh, next we have Patty Ortiz. Thank you, Patty. Thank you, Bert. Hi. I think uh, people here are somewhat familiar with me. I'm a member of. Uh, I live in University Hills. I'm board on the INC delegate for our neighborhood. Um, I'm also an engineer. I've worked on infrastructure projects, I've worked on detention projects, design, construction. I've worked on Superfund projects. I have what is called a PE. Everyone sitting up here has a PE. They're a registered professional engineer. And part of that licensure requirement is that PEs shall at all times recognize their primary obligation is to protect the safety, health, property, and welfare of the public. So what does that really mean? I mean, that's pretty easy to define when you're doing your work projects. But I always think of the example in 2004 when uh, CDOT was working on the C-470 overpass over I-70. And someone went by that project and they saw something and they called 911. And they said, that's not my project. I'm not sure what's going on there, but something doesn't look right. There's something wrong with the sagging girder. So 911 calls up CDOT, tells them there's something wrong with the signs. 
They go out and check the signs. An hour later, the girder falls and kills a family driving on I-70, coming down from, I from Evergreen. We're all human. We, we, we make mistakes. It's okay to have someone check our work. And I think it's in that light that I'm here to comment on some of the things on this project. I'm not intimately involved with this project. We've heard there's 900,000 or a million or a vast number of pages. Um, so we can't know all the details. But nonetheless, all these engineers sitting up here on the, this panel are thinking there's something wrong here. There's something going on. My first exposure to the Platte de Park Hill was at an INC ZAP meeting, and Drew came to me and said, you know, can someone help me because they're doing this drainage project and there's riprap and there's, and I said, no problem, that's, that's what I do in work, I'll, I'll help you understand, I'm sure it's not a big deal. So I go to Globeville, to their open house, and the only people there are park people. And I start looking at the project, and I said, this is a serious project. This is heavy infrastructure construction. Oh no, this is all about a park. This is about playgrounds and trails, etc. And I said, really? Because this is a pretty difficult spot to be doing all this. As I started looking a little bit more in the background materials, I found that my reservations were somewhat confirmed in the draft report on the lining for the open channel. One of the engineering companies doing the analysis said that the planned lining is very difficult, if not impossible, to construct as conceived. I brought it up at the open house, a subsequent open house, and they said, well, I'm sorry they said that. The final report doesn't say that, and we found a way to mitigate from that. So as a small business owner, I attended a number of uh, outreach events on the Central 70 wanted to understand what the whole project entailed. And then I got a sense of the project. And the way I characterize it, it's sort of like a T-Rex, adding in Hanging Lakes Tunnel, adding in mitigation at Rocky Mountain Arsenal, all in one. The advantage of T-Rex, though, in going below ground, is all the utility, there's nothing going across there. When they open up this ditch, they're gonna have to relocate every sewer line, every water line, every gas line, every electric line, every fiber optic line, everything that they find there. With Hanging Lakes, they're gonna keep, supposedly keep the viaduct open while they do the lowering. That's pretty complicated construction. And the advantage of doing what they did, something similar to Hanging Lakes, is if you're up in the mountains, you can stop traffic. It's going to be pretty difficult in this location. With Rocky Mountain Arsenal, um, the cleanup there, actually the arsenal is designed pretty well. There's a central where stuff is, and then there's a two mile buffer all around. If anything happens, you have that space of two miles before it encounters the public. That is not the case in this case. Normally what you do with hazardous waste sites is you isolate them. Either you isolate them in place, or you pick them up and take them away. You don't do a partial removal, which is what they're doing at Glowville Landing, and you don't cut an open drench across the whole contamination, cutting across the predominant groundwater flow condition direction. So actually the PCL is the one option that intercepts the most number of hazardous, potential hazardous waste locations, leaking underground storage tanks and underground storage tanks that haven't yet been identified as leaking. So what would happen, you know, so I asked at some of the open houses, have they considered what's, how this is going to affect the groundwater regime in the area? And they said, no, that's for the design build team to solve. So if you can imagine putting a wall or a dam underground, what happens? Water backs up. The most innocent thing would be your sump pumps may have to start running more, or you might need sump pumps where you didn't have them. The worst thing that would happen is groundwater is introduced into contaminated materials that are not yet saturated. Now it enters the whole groundwater regime, 
and contamination has the potential to go off-site. That's a regime that feeds the South Platte, that feeds the farmers who water their crops, all the way from Denver, out to Weld County, Fort Morgan, Julesburg, the heavy metals go on. We're at, we're at uh, six and a half minutes. Going underground always introduces problems. The easiest thing is to stay above ground. Thank you. And next we have John Van Scriver. Thank you. Can you see me? Can you hear me? <clears throat> My name is John Van Skyver. I've been listening interesting, these interesting comments by everybody who preceded me. I'm an engineer also, uh, and, um, but I also have a, a business degree. And I, before I talk to people, I try to, sometimes I can't really figure what angle to take. Uh, I've been involved in, the, uh, in this project from the get-go, uh, and I, and I took, would be repeating things that people before me have already said. So I was having a tough time with that. We went on to dinner last night to Grand China. I was looking for a little bit of uh, inspiration. And uh, so I got, you know, the, the cookie they give you at the end, and I got this uh, piece of paper with inspiration. And it goes like this. People may doubt what you say, but they will believe what you do. It also has some handy things on the back side. Learn Chinese. <laughs> the word for taste is cow wee. Remember that. And then also, for a real kicker on it, it's got my five lucky numbers that I go play. That's my report. But just one thing I'd like to say beyond that. I just wanted to pick out one item that to me was a key item that could be a linchpin in this, this entire project, could change things. Maybe this is, not, this is more about the drainage area than it is about uh, the highway, although they are definitely connected. In City Park Golf Course, the position, a, a place was located on the west end of the park, which has always provided detention. Uh, at this time, I'd like to invite uh, Brid Bridget Walsh up to the stage. I need someone to hold up a picture for me. This picture will be something that can be held up, but not seen by you, I think, because the lighting is wrong. <laughs> Yay, the big one. First of all, we'll see if it can even be seen from, uh, turn it over that, yeah, that other one, yeah. Uh, let's see, it has to be turned the other direction. Can, can. This is just a test, folks, okay? No, no not that way either. Like this. All right, can anybody see that? Can anybody, can, can I see it by coming around here? This would be better as a PowerPoint. Okay, this is the Montclair Basin starts uh, we're still upside down here. <laughs> Sorry. Starts at uh, Fairmont Cemetery down here, runs down through here, and I point a couple of things out. This is Farrell Lake here. This is the, uh, the golf course. Uh, there's more sort of dark colored water there, but the place they want to put this detention structure is in the west end of the golf course there. It's just in the general area. You know where the golf course is at York right there. You notice these have dark circles there. It means they already are detaining water. And the, the detention they want to build is right here. Okay, thank you, Bridget. You can get even with me later. <laughs> and the plan is for a 215-acre-foot detention plan, the de detention structure lake in the west side of City Park. You probably all heard about it. Uh, it would be uh, cover 35 acres and completely change the way the golf course is. Cost $40 million also. Uh, and I'm going to just step aside a little bit to the, to the legal positions, and that is that this, that detention pond, and the reason I wanted you to lift that up, um, Bridget, was because that detention pond does nothing for the golf course. 
There is no a valuable use of putting it in there. They say, well, they're designing it to a point where it can be you can play golf there. That's fine, but in essence, it provides no benefit directly to that. Uh, it is within a designated park in Denver, and it would be a large project that would be built there, sort of industrial project would be built there, which would not be for, uh, for park uses. It would be a non-park use that's going to be detaining water that would be coming down and reducing flooding at the highway. My position is, and I'm not going to go on beyond this, is that I oppose there is a, and we do have a pending lawsuit right now with um, pretty soon. But if you want to talk about this question about this subject, you could direct them to me later. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And now we have Andrea Gelfuso. Just Hi, can you hear me? If I stand up, it doesn't make that much of a difference. I'm one of the attorneys working on the Clean Air Act lawsuit, and I'd like to tell you about our claims. This is our petition. It's 98 pages long. We had 17 separate claims, so I can only summarize it briefly. We allege that in approving the I-70 expansion, the Federal Highways Administration, and I'll refer to them as FHWA, did not comply with three laws. National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, the Clean Air Act, CAA, and the Federal Aid Highway Act, FAHA. Under NEPA, federal agencies are required to disclose the impacts of a highway project to the public and consider reasonable alternatives. We allege that FHWA did not consider the impacts to public health that will result from increasing traffic in the I-70 corridor by 65%. From 177,000 vehicles, trips per day, to 292,000 by 2035. How does increased traffic impact human health days, you've seen warnings about unsafe air quality because of smoke from wildfires. Wildfires like cars and trucks emit particulate matter, it's called PM. The bigger particles called PM10 damage your heart and lungs, cause cardiovascular disease and asthma. Super fine particles, those are called PM2.5, they're so small they enter your blood. They're in your bloodstream. And studies show these smaller particles, called PM2.5, are even more of a risk to human health than PM10. A 2014 report by Denver's Department of Environmental Health found that people living in the neighborhoods adjacent to the proposed I-70 project are already suffering from the effects of air pollution. Kids in those neighborhoods already have a 40% greater rate of hospitalizations from asthma. Not from kids in Colorado in general, from kids in other Denver neighborhoods. Adults in those neighborhoods already have a 50% greater rate of, of dying from cardiovascular disease than adults in other Denver neighborhoods. It's the highway. Sure. Okay. Um, even worse, so tell me, is this better? Yes. I'm Italian, so it's like, you know. Um, even worse, people in those neighborhoods have an average lifespan that is 3.5 years shorter on average than people in other Denver neighborhoods. So air pollution is already making people living near the highway sick, cutting off years of their lives, and yet this project will likely cause more air pollution from increased traffic. We allege that the environmental impact studies done for these, this project don't disclose the human health impacts of the project, and that FHWA failed to consider a reasonable alternative of rerouting some of the traffic to I-76-270. We allege the failure to consider the health impacts of the project 
violates NEPA. And FHA, FHWA didn't even require air quality modeling for the smallest particles that cause the most damage, the 2.5. Another thing, CDOT proposes to submerge the highway, create a traffic tunnel, and to benefit the neighborhoods by putting an 800-foot cover on top of the tunnel. The cover will include athletic fields and playgrounds. So athletic fields, playgrounds. The final EIS states that if traffic stops inside the tunnel for more than 27 minutes, to protect the drivers inside the tunnel, they need a tunnel ventilation system. The tunnel ventilation system consists of 25 jet fans that will blow truck and car exhaust out each end at the upper of the tunnel, and there is no filtration system. The exhaust will be vented just under the lip of each end of that 800-foot tunnel. During rush hour, while well, kids and adults are likely to be on the athletic fields and playgrounds. FHWA did not analyze whether venting vehicle exhaust would pose a risk to kids and adults exposed to those emissions from the tunnel. We allege that those health impacts to kids and adults should be considered under NEPA. We also allege the project will violate the Clean Air Act. Under the CAA, federally funded highway projects, and we're the ones, taxpayers, who are funding this, have to demonstrate they won't cause a violation of air quality standards called the NACs. NACs are the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. NACs are health-based. If a project violates these standards, human health will be affected. We allege that FHWA did not demonstrate that the increased traffic from the project won't violate air quality standards designed to protect human health. Based on FHWA's analysis, this project will come really close to violating the NACs for PM10. The magic number for violating the NACs for PM10, can you see this? No. 154.99. Microns. Microns. That's the standard, 154.99. FHWA analyzed how much air pollution this project would create three different times. Each time they used very different numbers to calculate the air pollution caused by the project. But every time they did the analysis, the project narrowly avoided violating the NACs by a tiny fraction. That's how, that's how under the standard they are. So look. We also allege that FHWA left out of their analysis important information like half the truck traffic in the project area. And the project is already within a hair of violating the NACs. So they haven't demonstrated that this project won't violate the health-based standards of the Clean Air Act. Finally, under the Federal Aid Highway Act, FHWA is required to file, follow a specific procedure to ensure the final decisions on the project are made in the best overall public interest. We allege that FHWA did not do the analysis required to demonstrate that this project is in the best overall public interest. Thank you. Thank you. Before you, before you start, uh, I have a request from Bill. Is this from Bill? No, from Bert, sorry. Uh, he wanted to just follow up in something uh, very quickly. Can you do that? Is that okay? You all okay with that? All right. Can you just quickly say what you wanted to say? You need a microphone. And in 17 seconds. Uh, just to follow up on this outstanding presentation from Andrea, Andrea when I was on the uh, Citizens Advisory Committee, representing the Sierra Club in 205 and 7 and so forth. We set up, I got two programs set up to take a hard look at the health impacts, not just compliance with the conformity and so forth, but what's it really doing to people. And the first was a panel set up of scientific experts, uh, people from CU Health and so forth. And uh, it got going, it was going to take a look at the metrics involved and so forth. CDOT killed that after about a year, year and a half of meetings. 
The second one was a little later working with Bob Yankee. Uh, we were going to set up a, a new air quality monitoring station somewhere near I-70 and I-25. Uh, it was funded by FHWA with a, a Sierra Club and Waddle. And uh, compensation was that uh, FHWA would FHWA would fund certain projects. Uh, that one got started. We worked closely with the City Air Quality Agency, and then after a couple of years, CDOT killed that too. So they weren't concerned with cancer, with a lot of things, uh, carcinogenics, and so forth. They were concerned with their damn bureaucratic paperwork that I mentioned in the beginning. Thank you. And last on our panel, we have Kyle Zeppelin. He's going to speak, and then, uh, is it that we're going to have a, a little break and collect questions? Is that correct? Yes. And then uh, Loretta will take care of that. Thanks. Thanks, Kyle. Well, thanks for having me. I'm Kyle Zeppelin. Um, we're a company, Zeppelin Development. We've been doing projects around, around the urban core of Denver, um, starting Lodo in the mid-70s uh, with my dad. And, um, got highly involved in the neighborhood process and um, doing some more catalytic projects and really seeing things through uh, very underappreciated urban neighborhoods um, in the core. So uh, started with Lodo, Golden Triangle, um, and over the last 20 or so years we've been focused on this area called Rhino, which includes multiple neighborhoods. Really got drawn into this just look, looking at around the neighborhood. I live in Globeville with my two daughters. Um, and and uh, kind of live it and breathe it every day um, and just seeing what looked like a really stupid project that was plowing forward and having been involved in the process it was really the opposite of a linear process and um, at one point the tunnel got ruled out because it was a billion dollars and here we are um, talking about a project that's but the base cost is too big highways through cities um, are going to be multiple times more than the budget um, and this one looks like looks like a boondoggle. So really, just calling it for what it is. Uh, we got um, an ultimatum from um, the councilman for this district, actually, to not talk about these issues. That it was um, creating some challenges for the mayor. Um, and um, as you can imagine, for those of you who know Mickey, uh, some some people know me, but. Um, he's been around for a while. That really had the opposite effect on us where, uh, you can imagine that, where we, we got much more highly engaged to the point of really talking about these issues, having them be a major focus. Uh, and uh, fast forward a year later, um, kind of got sick of hearing ourselves talk and we're part of this amazing group of of plaintiffs um, that are, have looked at this thing and they skipped a bunch of steps uh, for not following NEPA for the drainage piece of this after saying that the city the city was taking that on. Um, so there's some really significant exposure there um, and and uh, that that's kind of where we stand today. But uh, looking at the project, you know, we've kind of dealt with all the the uh, questions of people that are not as informed on these issues, but um, saying what is the alternative to the highway, and the alternative to the highway is to not not build a highway. It exists all over the city, it exists all over the country, um, internationally. Um, you don't go to Cherry Creek on a highway. Uh, that there's a lot of alternatives uh, with all the growth that's occurring in the city. A lot of that growth is is north and west um, through some of these neighborhoods. Um, what's lacking is significant investments in affordable housing, green infrastructure, transit. Um, the possibilities for these neighborhoods are virtually endless. We get, I get tapped on the shoulder all the time by other developers and um, people that are work for the city that are uh, have a lot to lose. That say, you know, we really appreciate you taking this on. Um, we have. Too much exposure, uh, but we agree with you. This is a an existential opportunity for the city, uh, and really to build European style social housing. Every street can open up into a green bioswale. Uh, you know the opportunities for to to uh, I think there's some experts on the panel that described it a lot better. But to, to daylight stormwater, 
um, to have native grass, native trees, um, and all the walkability, bikeability, livability that goes along with that. Uh, we're still in a situation where there, we've made this huge commitment to commuter rail, uh, but there isn't transit for people that live in Denver. Uh, there basically is not urban transit. Um, it's continually sc scaling back. Uh, under 30-year-old people move to Denver and they pick up a car. Um, under 30-year-old people, which is what I did, moved to Chicago and got rid of, got rid of my car uh, because it was impractical and there was great alternatives for, for transit. So I think when you look around and see what's possible, um, we're just, we're not this backwards. Um, this is the biggest, uh, biggest infrastructure project in the history of the state. Um, and we could, there's opportunities to do much better than this. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I just want to go back over just a little bit. And this is your opportunity to, to write down those questions. Um, and I think we'll have individuals in the audience picking up questions. If you want to send them to the aisles, that would be great. Or there's a hand up back here. So we have a few people who have questions. Please ask questions. I'm just going to say there, this panel, give them another hand. What a great panel. So some of the things that, that I'm just going to go over really briefly what they've discussed. Um, lack of lack of exploration of alternatives, funding and cost issues, um, golf course issues, environmental and health issues, water quality and storage issues, environmental justice issues, um, and and you heard a developer who is engaged in now, um, a, you know, a, a NEPA project. This is really major, and for the 19th largest city in the country, this means something that we need to work at and look at this as a process. So please, if you have questions, again, there's food back there. If you want to take a break, take a little restroom break, um, go grab some more coffee or juice or anything else. This is a good time. We'll compile all those questions and come back and say, five minutes? Do we need five, 10 minutes? So this is a good opportunity to take a break. Okay? Thanks. All right. I'm going to have everybody come back in. We have a list of questions. Some of them we're going to try and streamline if they're similar and hopefully direct those to the um, appropriate person. But I'm sure anybody on the panel would be available to answer those questions. Um, one other thing I wanted to tell everyone, there's a lost phone. Um, if you can describe it, go back out to the table out here and um, and you can pick it up. So if you have lost a phone, I would remember if I lost my phone, but um, please go out to the table because we won't know how to unlock it. Um, so please go out and grab your phone, identify your phone so we can give it to the appropriate person. The other thing I wanted to note for everyone is if you cannot see the signs over here, um, we have blank chairs and spots for the city of Denver and for CDOT. And unfortunately, nobody is here from CDOT nor from the city of Denver. Um, Albus Brooks, um, council person for this neighborhood, um, for the appropriate neighborhoods for where the um, where we're talking about today, he couldn't make it today for some reason. But um, there's been communications with the city of Denver off and on for a while. There's been communications with CDOT, um, and no one is here from there today. So um, just wanted to make sure that everybody knew that they were invited today, and they are not here. Um, I'm going to hand this over to Lucia, and um, we'll get started on the questions from the audience. Thank you, Loretta. Um, thank you for also addressing that, because that was one of the questions that we have. How can you claim to have a public forum when only one side is presented? We only got word, like, a couple days ago that uh, the city would not be here. So. 
um, and it was after we've already publicized the event, and we still think that there's a lot of really good information out there, and it's just a loss for the city. Um, so I have uh, the questions divided into just sort of different areas, and uh, I, there are a lot of questions that would go to CDOT or the city, such as, isn't... Um, uh, you know, is this an issue of Tabor? Is that why we're ranked 50th out of 50? Um, C like CDOT has the power, how is this possible and why? Why do we need toll roads and a tunnel? Um, CDOT is giving 54 million to drainage per IGA, but it says there's no federal funds. How does CDOT segregate federal money so uh, from non-federal money? And if the partial cover lower alternative is legally blocked, will CDOT or can CDOT rebuild the viaduct in place or will the way be cleared for a boulevard? And why did CDOT fail to look at I-70 as a part of a more comprehensive solution of east-west mobility strategy with I-270, local street connectivity, rail, and other modes in the entire corridor from Aurora to Lakewood? Um, is it true that the FSEIS says only eight lanes are needed on I-70 in 2035 and 240? Why does the project allow for 22 lanes with service roads? Why is there no comprehensive plan to remediate Superfund sites first before mega projects are allowed? So these are kinds of questions that uh, would be addressed to someone from either the city or CDOT, and I wanted to make sure that your voices are heard and we can make sure that these questions get passed along to uh, these organizations or these uh, parts. So uh, with that out of the way, I want to go ahead and uh, uh, address um, uh, just one more for the city that the Mayor Hancock announced at his state city address that his goal is to cut trips of single occupancy vehicles by 50% by a certain year. How will the I-70 east-west expansion affect that goal? Why isn't that in project included in Denver's 2020 sustainability goals? How would the expansion impact that plan? And again, that would be a great question if someone was here from the city, and we will make sure that they do get that. So, onward. Um, we had a few questions that um, someone asks, and we'll see here, at a neighborhood meeting, CDOT themselves stated that traffic will be back to current levels in five to ten years. Can you, and we'll figure out who in a second, address the concept of induced demand and what other cities are doing instead of building more lanes? Who wants to take that on? Bert? And I'm Panelists, I would hope that you can try to limit your answers to no more than two minutes, yeah. if possible. Uh, induced demand is uh, sort of if you build it, they will come. Uh, I worked with Bob Yankee on that earlier this year to see if uh, the modeling of, of programs uh, address that properly, and if we could find any flaws that would indicate that they there will be actually more air pollution than the uh, models and so forth indicated. Uh, unfortunately, we could not. I could not find anything in this case because the key to induced demand is basically land use and how it's going to grow and where and so forth. And uh, it's almost impossible to look 30 or 40 years down the road with information that would stand up in court, which is what Bob wanted. But uh, it is a critical problem. But yet, basically, these. Uh, uh, travel demand models, uh, origin and destination, so forth, are built on the premise that if you build this, it will come. Traffic will shift from the older, slower, uh, more difficult routes to the new improvement. So it is, to a certain extent, taken care of. Uh, but again, to, to take care of it properly, you really need a lot more attention to control and planning and uh, uh, land use and urban design. Dennis would like to add a point. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, one of the things that happened in the process is people reviewed what CDOT's modeling was for the supplemental draft, 
and it was determined that CDOT had inflated the numbers, okay? They were supposed to use the 2035 regional plan adopted by Dr. Cog. That's what you do in all of these. CDOT actually kicked the numbers higher to further justify it. They got caught in that process, so when they redid the final, they waited until Dr. Cog put out the preliminary 2040 model, which adds five more years of growth, and used those numbers in the final as part of their plan now. Thank you. Uh, the next thing I want to ask about, and I want to go into contamination and health. Um, one person's got three questions here basically about contamination. What is the origin of the contamination? How is it stored and who's responsible for monitoring? Will it be mitigated? Can, who can answer that question? Anybody? Patty, thank you. I'm not sure I can answer it, but um, I think anywhere uh, you look at major cities, uh, you look at uh, Denver settling on the confluence of Cherry Creek and the South Platte. Um, the city, they start processes, they produce garbage, they put it out the back. So a lot of our has waste look, items are actually left over our history as people. What out, what's out at the arsenal is a result of, of World War II in terms of nerve agents, et cetera, and the manufacture of those. So we are bearing uh, sort of the, the sins of our fathers there in terms of cleaning it up. And at the time those were produced, they weren't considered contaminated. So you're gonna get close to the center of the city, which confluence of Cherry Creek to the South Platte, confluence of Sand Creek to the South Platte, is a major portion of the city. It's where everybody settled and it's where they did their industrial operations. What wasn't considered bad before is bad now. Um, so those are left over. The other thing that you have a little bit of the effect is the flooding that has occurred historically over time on the South Platte. So you're sort of mixing in cars that came down from Chatfield all the way to downtown. They're buried in there. Um, it, it's, it's just a real um, mix of things. And so it's difficult to tell what's all there and to quantify and label it. But you should expect everything and anything. Thank you, Patty. And since you mentioned flooding, uh, we do have some questions with regard to flooding. So with another, I'll just read them off. Uh, with another plan for stormwater detention plan for Park Hill Gulf, how will this impact the I-70 plan at the end? Then uh, speak to the Army Corps plan to release more water from Cherry Creek Reservoir and impact the, uh, at Global Landing. Uh, concern as shown in Houston, Hurricane community of Beaumont was flooded as a result of releasing water from reservoir, not the hurricane. And what are the alternatives if the city does not build the stormwater detention lane in City Park Golf Course? Is that a question for you, John? Or who knows that question? Yeah, I have to speak to the last one. Uh, the, the problem of putting, the, the issue is there has to be some detention in the system to allow the flow to be diminished down to about 4,000 CFS. Uh, this is at a place lower down as you're approaching Globeville. So a place to put water, for example, uh, for a while, while the regular, while, while much of the storm flood goes by and then empty that volume into the, into the system also. So if I say, I did say that I'm 100% against building a detention facility in, in uh, City Park Golf, uh, because it is not for park purposes. It certainly provides no benefit whatsoever to the park itself. It provides a good benefit uh, outside. It provides a good benefit to, uh, uh, to the highway and to uh, development down there. So if I say, I can snap my fingers right now, there is a lawsuit on it and it's in review now by the judge. We don't know what the outcome is going to be or whether there will be a, uh, an appeal beyond that. But let's just say for a moment, somebody snaps their fingers and say, we're not going to put, we are not going to put a detention area in the city park golf because it's not legal to do so. 
So you say, well, you could take the detention for a, a mount, which is 215 acre feet, you could move it down to the coal neighborhood, which was one of the situations, and then the city says, well, we're gonna, we're gonna tear down uh, 50 houses to do it. However, uh, that would be an all-in-one type of solution. Right now, City Park has a lot of detention it provides as it is, City Park and City Park Golf. It's about 100 acre feet of storage, which happens whether anybody does anything or not. When it rains, it's going to, it will retain that amount of water if the, if the storm is big enough. That will actually happen. It will cost nothing to do that. Except, here's the hitch, if you try to, to say you're going to detain, detain water without, a, uh, without a, an agreement or something like that to keep it as such, uh, it would be, the, if, if that piece of property, say the ball field is located, I'm getting it down a little bit too small here maybe, but right between the zoo and the museum, there's the ball field. It is in the northeast corner. Uh, if, you does, if you say, we're gonna count on that for 40 acre feet of storage, which is what it's probably good for. However, if somebody comes along with a, a building design and says, I, you know, that's a perfect piece of land right there next to my museum where I could build another, another building or something like that. So what you have to actually do is you have to designate the ball fields or other detention areas that they will be used for detention. They have, that is their primary purpose and it can, that cannot be lessened. At that point, you are good to count on that, and it, but it, what it actually does is shut down development in the park and building a building in that spot is a very good thing to do because we probably don't want another building there as what we would just rather have the detention. So I would say we work, work towards a, a, a signifying these, these inadvertent detention areas that I, that I mentioned, and that would amount to maybe half of what they need. Even taking the other part of that half, another couple hundred acre feet, and then trying to find a place down in Cole neighborhood, which was one of the parts of the original design, and split the burden, basically. In other words, the upper neighborhoods would deal with what's happening in City Park with some uh, flooding going to be expected there, and also you would have another detention area down by coal. Is there, uh, any, oh. okay, I'll stop. Is, there is there anyone else who wants to address the um, actual flooding? Down here. Uh, Kyle. Kyle, Bill, and then Kyle. So, or Kyle and Bill. I'm far from an engineer, but um, kind of geek out on these things, but the uh, the kind of offensive part of taking an existing permeable area, which is the golf course, uh, turning turning that into a, a drain, drainage, it's just somewhat inefficient. Uh, the solution uh, for drainage um, in a more comprehensive way is to take existing impermeable areas, scrape paving, turn it green, there's uh, that can be accomplished for much lesser cost than um, these over-engineered solutions where you're digging pipes in the ground um, and centralizing it in the way that's happening. So, uh, you know, really trying to look at this thing more holistically, which is consistent with what other major cities, peer cities are doing in Portland and LA and, and Seattle, which is, uh, including a bioswale in basically every street profile. We have, in a lot of cases, the right of way to, to be able to account for that. Um, there's not a need for 70-foot, two-lane streets uh, that, that are solid paving that facilitate higher speeds. Um, the other part of this is that the area, the open channel through uh, coal is uh, mostly in an area of former industrial or marginal industrial that's clear of residential development. So the pretense that um, this drainage is serving residential development, it's just, you're at that point, you're basically um, at, at the low point. Um, you've already cleared the residential, um, so that would already be subject to flooding, and that, that's the reason why it wasn't in the 2014 master plan for drainage. Um, they signed the intergovernmental agreement, and, and two years later, uh, there, it's the biggest fee increase in the history of the city uh, to pay for a project that never, never was a priority up to that point. So I think the part about uh, you know spending 300 million dollars 
to serve global Elyria Swantia, um, if you've been part of the process for the last few years, is pretty comical just because, um, you know, it's hard to get a crossing so kids can get across railroad tracks safely to be able to get to school. That's a couple hundred thousand dollar solution, um, which is, this isn't for the benefit of those neighborhoods. Thank you, Tom. Did you want to add anything, Bill? We're going to pass that back down. On the question of where are there other solutions possible, yeah, there's a whole range of solutions that are out there. The problem is that uh, the city, um, as I said, took the, the portion from uh, about 39th to uh, the golf course and said, this is a done deal. You can go look at the rest of the basin. So that uh, cut, <laughs> that shut down us look at alternatives. But I can tell you there, there are many different ways to do this. Um, as for the uh, detention, we call it inadvertent detention at Urban Range. And uh, we always, if we were going to recognize it uh, in the hydrology, we would sign an IGA with the affected local governments uh, to require that they uh, protect those areas. And uh, once or twice, we had to use those agreements to uh, keep that area open, not, not in Denver, but around the, just around the uh, metro area. So uh, you need some kind of a, a legal mechanism to uh, protect them. Thank you. Hold on to that. Okay, so the uh, next uh, bit of questions are about health, and then they're going to go a little bit into the lawsuit. They're a little bit overlap. So one of the questions was, uh, there's two of the same questions. Uh, Robert Woods Johnson Foundation study on life expectancy shows an 11 year difference in 2016 between Washington Park people versus Globeville. 84 years for Wash Park, 73 for Globeville. Um, just a comment in light of the statistics of the three and a half year discrepancy in life. So I guess that would be you, Patty, do you know anything about that? Not Patty, I'm sorry. Um, Andrea. I'm Andrea. not gonna go into that Andrea. because I'm not familiar with okay. that study. That's not something, I'm gonna stick with what we covered in the petition. Okay, so you might wanna hold on to that microphone. So, um, <laughs> so this is for Andrea, uh, and I'm gonna ask actually a few questions and see if you can, yes. What is the timeline for the lawsuit, for one? Let's just answer that one. We're expecting it will maybe take two years, um, just based on how the court court is slow, but, you know. Two years from starting now? It could be two years, yeah. Okay. But I can't tell you that. Lawyers always say it depends. <laughs> okay. But that's your best guess. Okay. Um, this one is also, it says for Andrea. Um, Can I throw one thing in there? Uh, this is Eric Cole. Get studied. Uh, so they skipped that step for NEPA, which is a massive part of that project. They got handed off to Denver. Uh, and then uh, what's related to that is the cost uh, to expose what the project costs. Um, there's a lot of history in this area. Uh, the project's likely to be a lot more expensive. We know. Um, some of the contractors involved that are throwing out swag numbers, everything's rounded down um, to get in the door with the project, and there there is no Fed funding for these overruns. So it's going to hit, you know, major areas of the state budget, um, health, education, other transportation projects, and then you've already seen the drainage costs go up six x um, from what was initially represented. Uh, so it basically, you know, at a time when you know, our, heard a stat, this is kind of random, but um, the city's budget for affordable housing is the same as Aspen, uh, which means there is no budget for affordable housing. Um, and so you're looking at basically all these other necessary projects um, and unprecedented economic growth that's happening and there's not scraps left over to do the things that we should be doing. Um, if you add to that a boondoggle on top of what's already an exorbitantly expensive project, it, it's going to hit every area hard. Thank you. 
So I don't know if there's anyone here on this panel that can answer this particular question. Why do we not know the interest rate on these loans? I don't think there are any loans yet, but how much is the interest on these mortgages? Does anyone have any information on the finances? I don't even know that they've come in. Yes, okay, Dennis. First of all, the information that's been submitted by the private partners or whatever CDOT will not release. And the private partners will be selling bonds or whatever to finance the project. Uh, CDOT's also selling bonds. They're putting their bridge program for the next 35 years up against the funding for this to back the bonds that go out, okay? They, when we've asked information before about this, have said, oh no, this is all privilege. In fact, when I wrote to the HPTE a couple years ago about their value of money report, their response to me was, we can't give you that information that puts us at a competitive disadvantage. My response to them was, who are you competing with? But those are the kind of answers you get. And if you remember what they did up on US 36, when they finally put out the contract, they redacted all the information claiming they could not put that out because that was private information. There's huge arguments over how you do a public-private partnership and the way these things go. So you need to know. The other point you have to understand is if you saw the legislature this year and you just saw the article last week with Kelly Bruff from the Chamber of Commerce, they're putting together another transportation bill, which is a tax increase to, quote, finance all the necessary roadway improvements throughout the state of Colorado. Thank you. Um, somebody had brought up a card from the audience uh, addressing what are the contaminants and it says FEIS said there were 132 contamination sites within the area of the ditch. These resulted from about 54 different industries, businesses including smelters. This is, as a note, one of the reasons any below grade option was dismissed before uh, Don Hunt re resurrected this option. So I'm not sure who submitted that. Maybe you'd like to step forward. Um, there you are. If you have questions about contempt. Okay. Fabulous. So it's from public information. Thank you. Okay. All right, so now uh, I want to talk about, um, we have a lot of questions on the alternative because a lot of people say, okay, great, this is a bad idea, but what should we do? So uh, let's talk in, talking about the alternatives. The, I think this is mostly referencing the alternative of rerouting up through 270 I-76. And somebody writes, there are lots of businesses, industries, and warehouses located in the I-70 corridor. How will their transport needs be met without the highway? Um, diverting I-70 traffic onto 270 I-76 will make traffic even worse on those highways. How will the increased traffic be addressed? And um, CDOT says there are 200 plus industries along the I-70 corridor and removing I-70 would cause semi-trucks on residential roads. Any thoughts about industry along the corridor? And um, CDOT, this is a couple for Dennis, CDOT says the ditch the ditch folks want a Colorado Boulevard on steroids. Can you describe the type of street the group actually wants how it works and why it is capable of handling traffic, decreasing congestion, increasing mode choice. And could Kyle describe what this means in terms of future development potential? So let's, you know, I, I do. So those are all kind of together about the alternative. What, what do we do with the industries? Well, so if you look down that corridor, um, it looks like a lot of 30 and 40 year old industrial, which is uh, Rhino had the previous generation of that, um, and it's marginally used industrial. The weed warehouses uh, will continue to function or not. Uh, the uh, Safeway plant, which is kind of the most active, biggest requirement, um, is highly outdated. It's marginally used. 
Um, that industry is changing a lot. Um, the modern requirements for industrial look a lot different than what's down that corridor. And if you look in Adams County, um, the potential for that area to account for the big Amazon warehouses, um, and you know, you're talking about you know what Tesla has, which is you know 12, up to 12 million square feet. Um, there's no ability to do that. So it's clumsy, outdated industrial that has outlived its useful life in a lot of cases. Um, there is an ability uh, for those uses to continue to function with the street grid. Um, there's north, there's east-west connectivity virtually every three blocks. Um, and people, I mean, if you look at it, some of this is just so detached from reality. If you're coming from Stapleton, um, one section of the street grid jams up at MLK, you move to the next section over. Um, these are major, major connectors. Uh, there's a lot of capacity, all the studies have shown there's a lot of capacity in the street grid um, and not everybody's going to the same destination. So it routes people in a much more targeted way. There's an existing interstate highway at 270-76 that needs to be improved regardless. Um, it, that's an efficient way to get long haul traffic to where it wants to go, to the mountains or through the state. Um, and local traffic is better served by the street grid than uh, then, it, I mean, you can build 50 lanes um, through Elyria, Swansea, Globeville, um, and it's still bottlenecks down to four, four lanes at, at the mousetrap, and um, based on the same reasoning, you're expanding through Sunnyside. Um, the, the cycle never stops if you're trying to keep up with it by expanding highway capacity. It's just a single path urban highway, uh, which is not effective, it's just not an effective way even of moving cars, and um, obviously some ser serious collateral damage for people. It was part of the presentation at the City Club in 2015 when we presented the reroute and... Hello? Can you hear me? I'll try again. I was part of the presentation at the City Club in 2015 when we made the alternative presentation of the reroute and Dean Foreman presented an entire presentation that they called Colorado Boulevard on steroids. It was not. We were pushing for a parkway, a boulevard, which was only going to be about four lanes wide. The idea was to take all the regional traffic and divert it around the neighborhoods, which is what the city tried to do in 1960 when they were looking at building this. But they were stopped politically, and that's how it got routed where it was today, as opposed to on the county line between Adams County and Denver. Okay. So we're not looking to put a Colorado Boulevard in there, and the numbers work. Now, for the people who are saying, oh, gee, you can't put it on 270, obviously, 270 and 76 have to be widened. Adams County wants it widened. The argument over is, how many lanes would you need to replace I-70 to run up traffic on 270? But as Kyle just pointed out, a lot of this traffic is heading down to I-25. The question is, where exactly are they going and what connections are they making? You can't get that information from CDOT, okay? There is no, quote, origin destination studies, which is what used to have to be done for transportation planning when we started this entire process back in the 1960s. None of that data today they, will they give you, if they even have it. So you see a lot of traffic getting to I-25 but you can't tell you exactly where it's going, but you know the semis aren't going downtown. They're trying to get to other connections or other. The goal here was to divert the regional traffic. Local traffic can still function. Local traffic will get to the local businesses. We have the ability on the current network and with this parkway to carry it to local businesses. We would never attempt to put local businesses out of business. That's never been part of the goal here, okay? And the neighborhood endorses that. What we're trying to get rid of the unnecessary traffic that's going through the neighborhood that's causing all these problems. That's why people are looking for other alternatives. It's also the reason why they built E-470 a number of years ago, which is grossly underutilized. So this uh, next group of questions, I'm not sure how we answer that, but it says, why do you think CDOT is so malicious? CDOT is state. <laughs> Where is the pressure coming from? And then somebody else wrote something similar. What are the real motives for this mistake? 
who stands to gain for this? And this is to any panelist who wants to try to answer that one. That's a toughie. Okay, Dennis. <laughs> With this is, I probably have more experience with CDOT than anybody. It's over 30 years. I've sat in meetings at every level at CDOT. I also had a short stint with them in 2012 where I analyzed the mountain corridor for the executive director on what needed to be done up there. Uh, CDOT's position always has been, and they always play this with you, is we're the state, we're going to tell you what to do, we know what's best. That is inbred in that entire organization and has been at least for the last 40 or 50 years. I've had huge fights with them on numerous projects trying to get them to change their way. I've won a lot of battles. I've lost a lot of battles, okay? They're a very inflexible organization, okay? I'm not trying to be overly critical. I'm trying to give you my actual experience of dealing with that organization. Okay, for whatever reason, it was mostly political. They decided it was staying in this corridor. They're going to widen it. They're going to put the number of lanes in. They're going to do managed lanes. If you don't understand the managed lane concept, the Santa Bernardino Expressway lawsuit back in the 1970s determined that you could not take general traffic lanes away from the public for special purposes such as transit and carpooling. You had to keep them for the general public. So that meant all future widenings, if you wanted to charge a toll or set up a specific situation, it had to be the new lanes that were developed. That's why you see CDOT doing this widening to put the new lanes in and making them, quote, manage lanes that they can toll. The problem you have in the current society today, and you've heard the term used, these are Lexus lanes. The average person cannot afford to commute every day in those lanes. They're going to be stuck in the same six lanes that are out there on I-70 if they build this. That's all they ever plan on building for you and I to use, because I can guarantee you, I can't afford to use these Lexus lanes or like that. So that's the basic problem with that philosophy. And Whatever happens politically, they go with the political flow. And somewhere politically, it's been determined. And I, I, I have to say, the mayor and the city is partially behind the national weather. They want to be able to Did that go off? OK. All right. I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. And now we have the last uh, group of questions, which is appropriate at the end. and. What can we encourage neighbors to do to make a difference in stopping this project? Give simple, real, tactical ideas, please. What can INC do to help the city get this right for all of us? And what is the next step after we stop the ditch? So basically, what, what are these people here? Now that you're all appropriately outraged, what can you do to make things right for our community? And please feel free to pass around the mic. Well, lo lots of different opportunities, but one is just to, to get out of the shadows. I get, you know, told all the time by pretty prominent people in the community that um, they would love to get more involved, uh, but they're concerned about uh, the uh, likelihood of kind of vindictive actions um, by by the by the leadership and not not getting the benefit of this and the way to break the patronage crony system is to stand up to it and we just we need more voices that get out of the shadows it's a very mainstream position to uh, have an issue with a multi-billion dollar urban highway um, through a city getting this much growth um, and I think that's, you know, show up for meetings, be active on social media. Um, you know, those are two kind of really basic things. Um, and then uh, Ditch the Ditch has done an amazing job um, of organizing the, this effort. Uh, it includes a really broad coalition of people. Um, and, you know, there's a need for resources. So even if it's, you know, whatever people um, can afford to contribute there, I think, you know, we're... Uh, taking the lead on some funding, but uh, you know, there's a need for yard signs. Um, there's a need for uh, web materials, and then you know, the, this is becoming kind of much more national. And I think that's where the mayor's sensitive. That's where the 
governor's sensitive. They um, don't want to have to answer um, for the national to, to the national media, and they have aspirations beyond their current positions. Um, this really just needs to be exposed for what it is. So there's there's you know all the articles that have come out. You know I think the the most critical articles are the ones that have looked at it through through a national lens and saying um, you know they're they're not subject to some of the, just the the uh, company line that's pretty pervasive here. So I think probably uh, speaking out and uh, kind of building up the network and finding ways to contribute uh, to resources to, to the, ditch, the ditch effort. Please contact the gubernatorial candidates as well because uh, the next governor will be in a position to uh, make moves on this uh, if there, if some of the delay is uh, basically kicked into the next administration. So it really needs to be an issue in, in the gubernatorial race, uh, pressure of uh, candidates on both sides uh, about the issue, so, so it becomes the floor. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, Madam, Madam Chair, I'd like to Chair or Madam Moderator? Madam Moderator, either one. <laughs> I, I would like to, uh, uh, to uh, move a motion. It's offering a motion. I think we have a motion, um, and I just look back at INC rules, and it looks like it falls back to Robert's rules if we do have a motion, um, and I'm not a Robert's rules expert, so if someone else would like to speak on that, I don't know. Uh, well, uh, our bylaws is what we have to Wait, Margie. Margie. Between you and JJ. Uh, our bylaws are what we have, we're governed by. Uh, our bylaws for INC provide that a motion may be made from the floor. However, you would, uh, I, our bylaws require 10 days notice if there is an amendment to the bylaws. That requires 10 days. So a motion from the floor is appropriate as long as the motion does not include any language that provides that it will amend the bylaws. Uh -huh. So, yeah, usually when we have motions come to the floor, we, we figure out how the exact wording and verbiage so I, I was going to bring a motion to the floor if you have some language, but maybe it would be better to craft up language and then have it voted on at our next meeting. No. Because no. I haven't heard about that, so I don't know what language you're about to present. I don't think any of us have seen it. Okay, so let's have it. Here. I move that IMC neighborhoods oppose the proposed expansion of I-70 because it increases the health impacts on our neighborhoods. And I call upon, and we call upon, Governor Hickenlooper and Mayor Hancock to halt the project until all health impacts have been eliminated. We need a second. Well, there definitely needs to be a second. I will second that. What's your name? Stephanie Hunter. What neighborhood are you from? From the Honey. From the Honey? Yeah, that's right. Stephanie, Stephanie from the Highland United Neighbors. Can we second it? Yeah, she's the delegate. So when we, when we did sign in, everyone should have gotten a little blue card. So only delegates would be able to vote on a motion. Um, so this is brought to the floor, so a lot of time to discuss it, but we usually have discussion associated with any motion that we bring. So is there, is there any discussion from a delegate, any delegates that would like to speak in favor or against a motion from the INC to, can, can we say the words again? A motion that the INC neighborhood oppose the proposed expansion of I-70 because it increases the health impacts on our neighborhoods. And we call upon Governor Hickenlooper and the Mayor Hancock to halt the project until all health benefits have been eliminated. 
Oh, health impacts. Yeah, sorry, I say impacts. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you need to specify the type of impact. Yeah, yeah all right. So the discussion is you need to specify the type of impact. I would recommend having focus stop the and get it. So she's, she would like to see a, an amendment offered to the motion. And uh, what's your name and delegate? From what? Not a delegate. All right. So only delegates are able to add amendments to the motion. Um, I'd be tempted to have an amendment that just basically we just passed the very first sentence. The move that uh, <coughs> we move that INC neighborhood oppose the proposed expansion of I-70 because it increases the impacts on our neighborhoods. Well, that yeah, it is very simple. Just that one sentence. Yeah. So I so I propose that amendment. Mm, okay. So, it's a not friendly amendment. So is there a, yeah, so she's the chair today. <laughs> for that, that, that was trying to keep it very straightforward since this is a motion brought to the floor that hasn't had any prior discussion. Watering it down. Keeping it simple. Well, I'm saying it becomes a basis for something to build from. But like, I think we, we need that. Eight years ago, JJ, and it didn't work. This needs to be strong. All right. Well, if it needs to be strong, I recommend we write it and bring it up next month. <laughs> if it needs to be strong, we want to vote it up. All right. So, any other discussion? Oh, oh, Joe. So we got Joe over here. And I pose this to the group, but for Adrian to consider, I just heard a really great suggestion. So as a delegate, should we um, include anything about a consideration of the alternative, the reroute, and say we would like that to be considered? Do you think that's just a question? Uh, my, if I may answer, Madam Chair. Sure. Uh, the wording the, the here uh, is specific. I could have it back. Uh, the reroute, among other things, is one possible mitigation because it moves particularly the trucks that are causing most of the health effects to the north away from better than 9,000 of the affected households. Uh, but I think that it's important for INC not necessarily to define what that mitigation or what, the, what that elimination of health effects. To me, that's the job of CDOT and our engineers to figure out how to protect us. As Patty said at the start, that's what engineers are pledged to do. And I think we ought to let them do that, but we ought to give the politicians who won't let them do it, as you heard, get a little bit of a kick in the backside to get them to let the engineers loose, helping us, not hurting us. That's the idea. Here, here. If any delegate has lost their blue slip, then then you can get one from back at the table or right here, as long as we know. So, um, I don't know if there's any other discussion because I'd like to hear. I'm going to hand it down to JJ to hand to people. All right, do we have a Laura? Uh, my my is wordsmithing, but the term eliminated to me is. You can't eliminate it. Um, it's just a little, oh, sorry, wordsmithing, but the word eliminated is probably impossible. And so all I'm saying is perhaps mitigated, addressed more fully, something, but that was just a thought, because it otherwise sounds a little unrealistic. If I may respond. All right. The, 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 you're right. No, we're just having a discussion. Right? Uh, well, 
Yeah, and may I respond? Because I don't want the movement. Uh, the, the word eliminated has been carefully uh, selected because if you say mitigated, uh, you can do a mitigation by saying, okay, we're going to stop one truck and we've mitigated it some, a wee bit. We've been there. All these things, you know, the putting the cover on was a mitigation. Uh, so, uh, to me, uh, no, eliminated. And that puts the burden on the engineers, our buddies, and one, two, as it happens, to show that, the, the, that they've been eliminated down to the required level, which in this line of work is about a one in a million impact, which means it's not eliminated, but it's pulled down to what we as a society have decided over many years is an appropriate level of risk for this activity. And so that's why eliminated is the right word. All right, great. How may I remind everybody who's a delegate on behalf of their neighborhood that when you vote, you are voting for your entire neighborhood, supposedly. And unless you are pretty sure that everybody in your neighborhood agrees with uh, a vote, then I think it's uh, really only right to um, uh, uh, abstain, you, no matter how much you are in favor of this personally. I don't feel that my neighborhood has studied this and knows it all, and I haven't discussed it completely with them, and I don't want to speak on their behalf. Uh, just on a one-day uh, announcement of a vote. Agreed. Thank you. Uh, I'm Susan Bain from Wash Park East, and I just want to say I respectfully disagree with that. Um, that the delegates were elected, the boards were elected in the neighborhood associations to represent the views <clears throat> of the neighborhood and to um, do that to the best of their ability, but not required to take a poll on everything. All right, more discussion down here in the front. Margie? And then we'll go down to Margie. I wonder if it would be appropriate to do a friendly amendment and instead of uh, eliminate, uh, substitute words to comply with a federal and state uh, law. Those standards are too low. They're too large. All right, so we we'll a second for the friendly amendments. Unless, all right. I would like to call the question and take the vote. Yeah. All right. Uh, read it out one more time and then we'll... I'm, no. I move that INC neighborhoods oppose the proposed expansion of I-70 because it increases the health impacts on our neighborhoods and we call upon Governor Hickenlooper and Mayor Hancock to halt the project until all health impacts have been eliminated. All right, second. So we got a second already. So now this is the vote. All those in favor of INC approving that motion, please raise your hand and keep them up. But it's only the delegates if you're a delegate for your neighborhood organization. Put the blue. Put the blue little tag in your hand. So raise a, yeah, raise your hand if it's in favor. Yep. This is a great way to end the meeting here. This is right. Yeah, keep your hands up. We're going to have two people count to make sure we get the right number. Where's the count? I got, I got 21. That's what I got. That's what I All right, what do you guys got? I got 21. 21. Uh, well, we got two 21s and a 22. All right. Okay. All right. So we just want to. We just got to make sure we get the number right. So do you guys all feel comfortable with 22? Is that what we're seeing? Sounds good. All right. So 22 in favor. All those opposed to INC approving this motion, please raise your hand. All right. 
one lot. Right. Just two? All right. Yeah, I'm one of them. All right, and then I'll abstain. Abstain. And when I'm abstaining from the vote, one, two, three, four. Four? All right, so 22 in favor, two opposed, and four abstain. Does that match up with what our sign-in sheets are? Right. What's under? Yes. All right, well, thank you all very much. There you go. Democratic process. The motion carries. And it is. This is part of what I have. Adrian? So thank you guys very much. Adrian, I think we'll leave that. Did you leave? All right, well, so since we, got, we had that motion, uh, our secretary is asking that we make sure we do our due diligence for the INC meeting, too. So we have minutes from our last meeting. I would say all those in favor of approving our minutes from the last meeting. Yes. All right. All right. Let's go ahead and thank you again for coming. Yes. Thank you. And I think we're going to let them leave out of the hot lights. <laughs> we'll move on to approving um, the minutes. Did we vote on? Thank you, everyone. Approving the minutes. All those in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. aye. All those opposed? Any abstaining? Okay, the motion carries. Is there, do we have it? I make a motion. We'll make it. All right, so we went back into our records and realized we need to have a formal from the INC delegation for two of our board members. One is Joe Barrios from Uptown on the Hill, and the other is Loretta Kohler from the Baker neighborhood. So we get in, all those in favor of approving them as board members of INC. Say aye. Anyone opposed having them as board members? Anyone abstain? No? All right. Thank you. And the last thing is we want to really thank the subcommittee that worked to put this panel together and this discussion today. So thank you. Thank you.